Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a show business veteran whose name you may not know, but whose work you have most definitely seen and loved. For over 40 years, he was one of the most sought after, powerful, and respected casting directors in Hollywood. Starting in the early 70s as a casting director at CBS, then casting TV shows for superstar producer Aaron Spelling, then becoming senior vice president of talent and casting at NBC for 10 years, and also serving as vice president of television talent at Paramount Studios, our guest has helped create entertainment that has brought countless hours of joy to millions of people around the world. On the big screen, he was responsible for casting three mega hit movies, Grease, The Rocky Horror Picture Show, and Airplane. And in the world of television, he either cast or supervised dozens of hugely popular TV series, including Taxi, Fantasy Island, The Bob Newhart Show, Starsky and Hutch, Charlie's Angels, Cheers, Miami Vice, The Golden Girls, Seinfeld, L.A. Law, Hill Street Blues, Night Court, and believe me, I'm just scratching the surface. He produced and cast the Emmy Award-winning TV movie, The Boy in the Plastic Bubble, starring John Travolta, as well as the five-time Emmy Award-winning miniseries, The Lives of Benjamin Franklin, starring Melvin Douglas and Michael Learned, and the Emmy Award-winning TV movie, The Gathering, starring Ed Asner and Maureen Stapleton, as well as the 1988 TV remake of Inherit the Wind, starring Kirk Douglas and Jason Robards, which won three Emmy Awards. And my favorite of all his TV movies is An Early Frost, starring Gina Rollins and Ben Gazzara, which was the first movie about AIDS winning four Emmy Awards. He was responsible for launching the careers of countless stars, including Nick Nolte, John Ritter, David Hasselhoff, Amy Irving, James Woods, Lorenzo Lamas, Danny DeVito, Christina Hendricks, and dozens more. And get this. He was the one who cast Ted Danson in Cheers, and he was the one who cast the wonderful Georgia Engel to play Ted Baxter's wife, Georgette, in The Mary Tyler Moore Show. And now he's written a fascinating, entertaining, and insightful memoir entitled Sex, Drugs, and Pilot Season, Confessions of a Casting Director. I'm delighted to welcome the one and only Joel Thurm to our show. Joel, thank you so much for being here. Well, Harvey, the way I want to meet the person that you just described, you know, look in the mirror. Uh, well, I look in the mirror and it's like, yeah, I, I'm overwhelmed by the by, by by a lot of that stuff, too. But when you hang around long enough, you accumulate things. And I was I was by the way, I like to be described as legendary, not veteran. It makes me seem younger as a legend. <laughs> OK, uh, you're le you are a legend. <laughs> I'm also legendary for saying things like I just said. <laughs> <laughs> well, it got you this far. Don't change now. I, I do. do I, I have no intention of changing. And as a matter of fact, I turned 80 years old. And do you remember the Golden Girls? Yes, or, I do. Mazel do you, Thank you. But do you remember the, the way that, what's her name, Estelle Getty was allowed to say anything was, in the very first episode, it was said that she had a series of little strokes that destroyed what filter she had. Now, I haven't had the strokes, but when I turned 80, whatever remnants were left of my filter disappeared. <laughs> You're totally entitled and feel free. <laughs> Joel, if I were to sum up what a casting director does, tell me if I've got this right. First, you have to watch movies, TV shows and plays and get to know the work of the actors. Then you have to read the script very carefully. And then you have to create the magic that happens when the right actor plays the right part. Have I got that right? Well, pretty much so. It's it's I, I would I would describe it a little differently. It's very different. It's but but essentially you're right. And 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 there's a difference between like Frey being a casting director on a specific project and just being a casting director in general. So let's say on a specific project, you're given a script. So the first thing when you're given a script is you what the budget is. Is this a big budget movie? Is it a independent movie with a classy director that you're not going to pay anything above scale, but you'll still get people because the director is someone people want to work with? Or is it an unfunny pi half hour pilot at the end of pilot season and nobody's left and there's no money? <laughs> you know, so you have to know what you're dealing with. And that's how you set about, you know, telling someone or writing down your ideas. 
But, you clearly uh, have a knack for detecting star quality in people. How much of the job is about following your intuition? I'd say 99%. 90, and that, well, the thing is, it's you, you have an intuition, and the hard problem is staying with your intuition and your gut, <laughs> you know, despite other things that may try to influence you to do something else. Now, sometimes that gut is wrong, but in my case, it was right more often than it was wrong. Who has a bigger say in the casting process, Joel, the writers or the directors? It all depends on the project. In movies, feature films, the director generally has the last say. The director is the big boss. On television, it's almost always the writer. However, if you get into a situation where I'm not sure Ryan Murphy is writing anymore, but if it's a Ryan Murphy project, you can bet that he's going to have the last word. The same way when I worked for Spelling Goldberg. By the way, it's interesting. And now I've done several of these things and everybody refers to Spelling, but they forget about poor Mr. Goldberg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know? but but it, it all it the it the eight hundred pound gorilla varies from project to project. I want to ask you about auditions. I've had a number of highly successful actors tell me that they're terrible at auditions, but they do a really great job once they got the part. How yes, and it's, and it's my job to know that, and it's my job to tell after the really good actor did a really bad reading to tell the people. It wasn't a great reading. He never does great readings. He just does good performances. So it's my job to know that and tell people that. Did you ever have the opposite thing happen where the actor gives a great audition and then turns out to be a total dud when they're playing the role? Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. But on a lesser level, it happens mostly, or I shouldn't say mostly, it happens very often with people, actors who who come from soap operas where they're what they're going to what they're going to read in the room for you it's never going to get better than that you know it's uh there there's a kind of i don't know if I want to say a lower standard but there's something that happens when you have to memorize so much dialogue every day for a soap you you do shorthands or you do things that just are not conducive to great acting but to great memorizing but no there are people who i know would come in they'd read and they'd read well and they say the producer would like them, whoever's hearing that project say, okay, well, you like him, but that's what it's going to be. It's never going to be better than that. That, And if you like that and you're happy with that, go for it. Oh, that's so. really fascinating. You wrote about the frustration of wanting a certain actor or actress for a role and then being overruled by your bosses. Did that happen a lot? Well, <laughs> not so much. Old. Yes, it happens a lot. It, it does happen a lot. Because I was, you know, casting directors never have the final decision. We cajole, we beat you over the head. We we bring in, you know, material to say, look. But uh, unfortunately, we and uh, we don't make the final decision. However, I've always been very good about persuading people or bringing people over to my side when they necessarily wa weren't on the side to begin with. And that's those are the skills that you just pick up by learning how to, I hate to say handle people, but you do, you, you learn, you, and let me put this way, if you either learn that or you're a really bad casting director and I wouldn't hire that casting director. <laughs> now you've had so many unique and memorable experiences that I loved reading about in your book. For example, in 1967, when you were the assistant manager at the Westbury Music <laughs> Fair, Judy Garland was there for six nights. Do you have yeah. any memories about Judy that you can share with us, Joel? Well, I, ha I have total memories. And by the way, I've, I've uh, just to make sure that let you know that what I'm going to tell you, uh, Lorna Luft is a friend, Judy's other daughter. And and I told Lorna this the story that's coming up and said, yep, that was mama. So Judy was coming for for, for a week at Westbury. And she and Sid Luft, her then husband, who was a really good guy, he really was a good guy who tried to help her out of her financial things and whatever. So they showed up, but they showed up four hours early in the rain. <laughs> they were expected, say, at two, you know, like at four o'clock in the afternoon. They showed up at noon. It was a rainy, rainy day. The stage door was locked. They and they had to walk all the way around to front to where the box office was to be let in. There was no overhang, so they were like two drowned rats. And of course, I I let them in. Oh, I'm sorry. 
I brought them back to the very luxurious star dressing room. And, you know, but she was grumbling all the way through. Sid was fine, but... And then, you know, a couple of hours, let them settle. And, it, and it's, can I get you some hot tea? Can I do this? All the right things. Closer to showtime, I come over and uh, with, I bought two dozen roses. Oh. And I opened the door to give, give her the roses. And she looked at me, took the roses, looked back. As she was shutting the door, I could see her throwing the roses in the trash can. <laughs> no. Yeah, well, basically, it was like, it, it, was, it was one of these horrible days where everything had gone wrong. You know, it. I didn't take it personally. It's just, you know, how many times has this woman been given flowers in her life? You have to think. 100,000 or whatever. But all that is not unimportant because, yeah, she was about 15 minutes late in coming out of the dressing room for opening night. And there were there were some celebrities there opening night. She was late out of her dressing room, but she went down on that stage and she killed. She was the Judy Garland everybody came to see. And she was wonderful. A few nights later, into the middle of the run, she completely lost her voice. But she also knew that when I say that if she didn't perform that night, she wouldn't be getting paid for that night, the way it works. And she needed to do, she was doing this tour of wherever she was playing to pay back a very serious IRS debt. So she came out, she got applause as she walked out. And then when she got down to the stage, in her hoarse voice, she said, look, I'm, you hear my voice, but you know what? I'm going to do my best for you guys tonight. And she got another 20 minute standing ovation <laughs> before croaking through the rest of it. But that's the effect that she had on us. You know, we, we, we were accept, we, we accept her in whatever form we could get. Wow. What an experience. Now, I want to just take you back for a minute. You mentioned Pearl Bailey. You wrote in your book that of all the stars who played Dolly, Pearl Bailey was the best. What made her the best? Well, I narrowed it to the, the two. Carol Channing was Carol Channing was Carol Channing. So she's out of the picture. And, I, the, um, these, and I'll go you the way I've seen. These are the people. All right. Carol Channing was replaced by Ginger Rogers, who was... So boring, I can't tell you. <laughs> Whatever made Ginger Rogers good had nothing to do with what you needed for Dolly. So she was boring. She looked good and so on. The next one was Martha Ray. And Martha Ray was wonderful in her speeches to her dead husband, the Ephraim speeches where she's looking up to Garrick, okay? I forget, it was Betty Grable who came in. And I think then Pearl. And Pearl was absolutely wonderful. And I'm going to compare Pearl to the one who I think was technically the best, which is Bette Midler. And oh. Bette Midler came in after me many, many years later. Bette Midler was absolutely perfect for the part. The right age. She's a bossy lady. She's, you know, I think that it's intimated that even though the character is Irish, she's really Jewish. <laughs> you know, but... Bet was perfect, and Bet did not do any Divine Miss M stuff. She played the character very straight. Right. I wished she would have done a little more Bet Midler in it instead of being faithful to the character. But that's why she so Pearl was faithful to the character, but she was also able to add Pearlisms. That's right, honey, with the hands, or you tell him, darling, or. You know, whatever it was, she was the character, but she was able to add what made her special to the character. So those are my favorite, too. You've said publicly, actually, many times that you owe your entire career in Hollywood to Pearl Bailey because Absolutely. She, she brought you from New York to work on her TV variety show. What do you think she saw in you? Yeah, I, I, I... Well, first of all, I was I was very young. I was about I was like 20, somewhere between 20 and 21 when I got a job at David Merrick as and at first I before I became his casting director, I was company manager of Hello Dolly. And which meant being there, you know, dealing with all little backstage squabbles, you know, working those out. Uh, making sure the box office was in sync after all the ticket, you know, just making sure the financial things were right. And I would have to stay through the first act of the show. Uh, but uh, it, it, when I met Pearl, I was taken back the first night that I was uh, hired, that I got the job. I was taken back by Merrick's general manager, a man named Jack Schlissel, who was my direct boss. 
And he introduced me to Pearl as this is your new company manager, Joel Thurm. And she gives me a big hug. And so nice to have you. And come on back after the show. Come on back after. So it was established that many, many nights I'd come back after the show. I would sit having a glass of wine, waiting for her to change. And then we'd leave, grab, she had a big brandy snifter full of Soma. Soma was like a, a mild muscle relaxer. But when you take three or four of them together with a glass of wine, it becomes a little more than a little relaxer, but still wonderful. <laughs> so <laughs> so having, having been fortified, we'd march down to Sardi's and have dinner. She adopted me as her son. She was in New York all alone when her family was in California. So, you know, it's a, you, you work your ass off all night, you know, and, it, and, you, and it, is, it is work doing that show. And Pearl also, after the show was over, she would always do 20 minutes of her nightclub act after doing a full thing of Dolly. And you'd have to stop her. The stage manager would have to come out and say, we're going into overtime. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Wow. But for some reason... I knew who she was. My, my mother was a was uh, an ordinary housewife in, in in Brooklyn, but she loved movies and show business. Couldn't afford to go to them, but loved movies and show business. I knew who Pearl Bailey and Lena Horne were, the only two black nationally known stars, if you will. So I knew who Pearl and we had we had Pearl Bailey records in the house singing to to the tango and other other so I knew exactly who she was and I was very impressed with her and for some reason she took a liking to me and then one day she just said I can't tell anybody don't tell anybody this but ABC wants me to do my own show my own variety show do you want to come to California and work on it and I said, yeah, but if it, uh, only if it's a real job. Yes, I'd love to. We cut. I, you know, I, we both wind up in California. I show up at the office of Pearl, at the Hollywood Palace, and there is no job. Oh, I've given up my apartment in New York. Great apartment, 123 Waverly Place. <laughs> uh, good apartment. And what I learned then is that if a star wants someone on a payroll and the budget, it gets put on, even though there's no real job. And, and to me, I thought that was something that wasn't very nice. I was, I was very disappointed, but I, I'm, I'm smart and clever. And I made it known, look, I'm not Pearl's posse. I'm here to work on the show. I'm not here. I'm here for myself. And anything you say in front of me is not going to get back to Pearl. I'm not, I'm not like that. And finally, they gave me something to do. I did music clearances. And, and I learned. I, I learned how to do music clearances. And it was slightly creative because if there was a song that we wanted that we couldn't afford, I would say, well, what about this, this, or this? Do you get the same feeling, but we can afford them? You know? And so that was the beginning of my relationship with Pearl. You know? It's amazing what you built from that. I was also amazed to read in your book, Joel, that at one point in your career as a casting director at CBS, even though you were doing a great job working on hugely successful TV shows, your salary was so low that you had to earn extra money by baking cakes for a restaurant. Why did they pay you so poorly? By the way, it was Joe Allen's, not just any restaurant. <laughs> Joe, Joe Allen's had opened up a branch in, in, uh, in L.A., I was never very interested in money. I didn't care. I had me to take care of. You know, I was in, in California. I was staying in a friend's house. I wasn't paying rent. The only thing I had to do was buy a car, which I did, a 1964 and a half Mustang, of course, <laughs> convertible. So I didn't care about money. I was having fun. This whole show business world was so much fun for me. And I, I, I knew I was never going to get married. I didn't have to worry. Well, of course, nowadays I could have gotten married. But so I, I didn't have anything to worry about. I, I, could, I could basically do what I wanted to do and have fun, even though I wasn't getting paid a lot of money. And, and why CBS was so chintzy, I have no idea. Wow. I just don't know. But I will tell you, my early work, I never got paid a lot of money, ever. I, you know how much money I got paid to cast Airplane? How much? Sixty five hundred dollars. Wow. Wow. 
Yeah, I think now there's a zero after that, you know. But I never got paid. I never made a lot of money. You know, just never well, of did. course, now I have to ask you about Greece, which is the largest grossing movie musical in history. Is it true that Olivia Newton-John was initially very reluctant to play Sandy in the movie? Yes. She was reluctant for a couple of reasons. She was, I think she's four years older than John and thought they would, she would look too old for him, which was nonsense, of course, once, once they actually got together. She also had done, I think it was an English science fiction movie after she had become a big star in Australia and, uh, and England. And she was embarrassed because the, the movie was terrible and she thought her performance was awful, which I'm sure it was. So she did something which I thought was incredibly smart of Olivia. And, you know, I sort of resent it a little bit when people refer to Olivia as oh, so beautiful and this and that. They never use the word smart. <laughs> and she was smart enough to say, OK, you know, I'm not sure I want to do this. Well, I want to see I want a screen test to see if I can do this. I, I don't I've never heard of an actor asking for a screen test before or since. But that's how smart she was. She really and, was. You know, so, I was intrigued by the decision to cast Stalker Channing in the role of Rizzo instead of Beverly D'Angelo. You clearly made the right choice. Uh, no, I didn't make the choice. I, you know, casting directors don't make choices. But Stockard is, Stockard is something that is, I guess the what I forget the phrases there. Something about the negative proves the point or something. Stockard, from everything we know about Stockard and her, her life and her background and her training, was totally wrong for the role of Rizzo. <laughs> In real life, this Upper East Side, well-born woman probably never even walked near a school that resembled Rydell. <laughs> but Stockard is an incredible actress. Yeah. And I, you know, I can't tell you why it worked, <laughs> but it did work. And th the test of that is when she sings the song, There Are Worse Things I Can Do. It's not a difficult song to sing. It doesn't have a great range of notes. But when you look at it, and I, the last time I looked at it carefully was on the big, big screen at the Hollywood Bowl, because they usually show Grease about every other year. You see, you, you, you don't see the acting, you feel the acting. She did such a great job with that song. Yeah, she you know, did. So it, it it defies every rule of casting, but she was fantastic, you know, and she got the job. Yeah, Alan Carr was managing her at that point, but that wasn't why she got the job. She came in and auditioned, and she did something that we liked better than Beverly D'Angelo. Wow. You know, or, or Lucy Arnaz was another one who was quite good, but uh, somehow Stockard was better than all of them. And I can't tell you why, but she was fantastic. Although now it's fascinating because Stockard, she's not a, let's put it this way. She would rather Greece not be the first thing that people talk about her as a performer. And the same thing, by the way, with Susan Sarandon in Rocky Horror Show. Right, right. <laughs> You know, the, the both of these movies are liable to be listed as the first thing in their, what do you call it? Their repertoire. No, no, not what do you call it when you, someone dies? Their, uh, oh, their obituary. obituary. Yeah, and I think that frightens them both to hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, it shouldn't. I now want to ask you about the movie Airplane, which is hilarious because it's the ultimate takedown of the disaster movie genre, and it's widely considered to be one of the greatest comedy movies of all time. In casting that movie, you had to fight the studio executives who wanted comedians, whereas you wanted serious, dramatic actors who would play their roles straight. And we all know you were right about that. How did you win that battle? Well, I, very, because it wasn't just me. It was, the studio was totally out of, before I even entered the picture, the studio, although they were the only studio in town who bought the project, they really didn't know what they had. They really didn't. Fortunately, there was one good executive who, from Paramount, his name was Tom Parry. He was the Paramount executive on the piece, and he understood what it should be. When I read the script, I, you know, I just kind of knew that for those characters to work, the the air, the controllers and so on, they had to be played straight in order for it to be funny. I knew that when reading the script and the guys, of course, wrote it that way. So I think that's one of the reasons that I got that job was I realized what they had, what they were trying to accomplish. So they hired me. 
to the great um, movie. And I and I had more fun casting that that project because it was just so much fun to be had with those guys because it was uh, and Peter Graves. I mean, I love the you know you read the book. My my I said when I after I got the job, I said okay. Now you have to promise me one thing: we have to use Peter Graves for the airline pilot. <laughs> and they looked at me and said, "Why?" And by by the way, in retrospect, I didn't realize how great of an idea it was. <laughs> <laughs> but but I said, when I was a little kid, you know, watching Saturday morning television, Peter Graves was a star of a show. And I wanted him so desperately for Peter Graves to be my father instead of my real father. <laughs> you know, it was so I, I guess I had a kid crush on on Peter Graves. And when I told them, I said, and I wanted to be that little boy in the cockpit. <laughs> so when I told them this story, of course, they laughed. And that's why Peter Graves was hired. Boy, am I glad you had that crush. Now, of course, <laughs> I have to ask you about the Golden Girls. And one of the real surprises in your book was that Betty White was not well liked by B. Arthur and Rue McClanahan. Did you ever find out why? Well, I've heard various reasons. B did not like Betty. That was the real B really didn't like Betty. Rue, Rue didn't, you know, didn't like her, didn't like her as well, but not not as much as B. Arthur didn't like her. And because Betty was not, B is an actress. B is an actress who prepares, knows the line, you know, does, Betty White is not really an actress. She's a personality who was able just, you know, through through whatever made her special, was was, was able to, to do whatever it was that Betty does. And I think B resented that a little bit. They'd be like, if there was a holdup in a scene, they had to stop. B would remain in character and Betty White would crack jokes. And which would make B get, you know, forget what she was doing. It was very frustrating for her. I mean, many years afterwards, I was on a plane next to B and uh, referred to Betty as a cunt. Oh, <laughs> yeah, really. But you know something? The and per, That was all personal. The working relationship between those four ladies was always perfect. The, the, the personal anim animosity never interfered with the show. Well, that's for sure. I was shocked when I read that. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, another really interesting thing I read, you were offered the chance to make a TV version of MAME, but you couldn't get a star willing to play the title role of MAME. Exactly. All the, I all still the major can't. female stars turned it down. Why? I have no idea why. And I try to find out. The last person offered the role was Michelle Lee. But we started with... Michelle Pfeiffer, Sigourney Weaver, uh, Glenn Close, you know, all women of a certain age, waspy women. But we even went down to uh, Carol Burnett. And even I said, you know what? If Diana Ross says, said, we'll do this, we could make it work with a black woman, too. And she said no. <laughs> Finally, when we got down the list, starting high, and we wound up uh, offering it to Michelle Lee, and Michelle Lee turned it down. That's when I said, I can't do this. And about a, two months ago, Michelle Lee was at a friend's wedding in Palm Springs. And I asked her, I said, do you remember getting an offer to do MAME on television? And you turned it down. And that's when I dropped the project. And she looked at me. She said, I never got an offer to do MAME. <laughs> what? Yeah. Well, what happens very often is the agent didn't, didn't follow through or the agent that I was talking to probably talked to an you know one of the more senior agents who was handling Michelle and the, it never even got to her oh that happens that's not the only time that happens that you know sense. I didn't know I didn't know Michelle and you know I just you know I just took the no for a no and then uh, stopped trying to do the project would she have accepted it I, we didn't, it didn't, it was, I, I gathered from the way we were talking a couple of weeks ago that she would have. Oh, what a shame. Hey, you know what? But well, no one's done it since either. It's there waiting to be done. Why hasn't someone else done it? <laughs> I don't know. They don't have your magic as a casting director. That's why. Well, what, what I wanted to do with it was, and I had almost convinced Jimmy Burroughs to do it with me. I wanted to do it as like, you see, 
these a half hour comedy being, you know, to, with, of, like a four camera comedy. Most of MAME takes place in interiors in either an apartment or in this place or that place. So I would have done it like a like a like a sitcom in front of an audience and have the audience reactions and the big outdoor number, the the, the, the you know, the horse thing when she gets on the horse that you do like you you handled in uh, what do you call it? Like, like you handle it on stage. You don't actually see it. You people, you see everybody's reactions to it. Anyway, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Now, in 1996, you produced a wonderful movie, It's My Party, which was based on a true story about an AIDS victim throwing a party for the most important people in his life and then committing suicide. It had a star-studded cast, but it wasn't a commercial success when it first came out. But now it's a big cult movie. You must be really happy about that. Well, I, I, yes, I am happy about that. And it's, it seems to get a little a little more culty and important every year. Uh, it's uh, I, I, I'm, I'm the mixed feelings about it because I know we could have made a better movie. I was hamstrung by Randall. Cl well, the, 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 the movie is, is about several episodes in the director's life, Randall Kleiser. Right. And Randall Kleiser and I have been kind of joined at the hip ever since I cast his USC master's thesis <laughs> and quickly followed by uh, Boy in the Plastic Bubble and a number of other projects. He wouldn't change things because it was his story. And I said, look, we, instead of stretching this over two days, the part, the real party, I should backtrack for your audience. A friend, a very good friend of mine, a responsible man who had AIDS, had just got a diagnosis that he had caught another opportunistic infection, which in a, in could have happened to him in about a month, he might have become a vegetable. The disease was called PML. I can't tell you, you know, the, the, the long Latin name. And so what he did is... He said, I'm not going to put my family through this. I'm not going to live for another 20 years as a vegetable in a hospital on a ventilator and all that. So he decided he was going to check out. He was going to throw a party, see all of his friends. And then when everybody left, take sleeping pills and um, and commit suicide. I mean, very unusual, you know, circumstances. But, you know, this is during AIDS and all sorts of odd things happened. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, we did that movie. And I think it could have been a better movie. It could have been a funnier movie. You know you're going to get the the the, the, the tears, uh, but we had a lot of humor in it. And but unfortunately, it was Randall's project, and I I couldn't get what I wanted. But it still worked. Oh, very much so. Now, Joel, I know you've been asked a million times about the notorious casting couch, and it's very well known in Hollywood that you never engaged in that kind of behavior. But you must have seen and heard plenty about it over the years. And the casting couch was not only an issue for women, but for male actors as well, correct? Absolutely. Well, my yeah, exactly. I guess be because I'm gay, I was more susceptible or more aware of that. There was one agent who, uh, and it was a very good agent with a very good client list who bragged to me, ex explained to me how he would lure men to his house and all that other stuff. And he explained it to me very carefully how he does it. You're kidding. You do that? With straight said, that, men. Huh? With, with uh, straight or gay, didn't matter. You know, he would just hit. And some straight men will, you know, if they think that way they're going to get a good agent, they'll put out. Wow. But once he told me this, I said, you know, you know, you know, this this is very, very upsetting to me. And, you know, I'm sorry we had this talk and it was over. But I never spoke to him again. I would deal with other agents in his office, but I would never deal with him. And the same thing happened with a casting director who told me, you know, this was his, him, he, again, he told me his MO of how he would seduce guys. And after he told me this, I would never approve him as a casting director. So, you know, uh, I, I believe me, I have I, I'm not exactly moral in every aspect of my life, but that was one that I was very, very moral about. Bravo, Joel. Has the Me Too movement finally eliminated that behavior, do you think? No, it'll never be eliminated. <laughs> I mean, you know, someone is always going to, and, and it doesn't particularly matter in show business, someone is always going to want something more than someone else. And someone is going to be willing to do 
something a little out of the ordinary to get what they want. Well, that's that's human nature. Well, okay, then putting aside the casting couch, there's something else that can happen to young people on their way up. And it's called sexual networking, which is about dating and sleeping with people who can help you in your career. And by the way, as you've pointed out, it doesn't just happen in show business. Did you ever experience that as a young man? Yes, of course I did. How do you think I got where I am? <laughs> no, I do. it's funny you use that phrase because I thought I created the phrase sexual networking. And I'll give you, I'll tell you exactly what this meant. This was when back in New York, when I was, I guess I was working for David Merrick, you know, but I had, I had a good job, but I also knew that if I started dating this one particular producer who I was not attracted to, but I knew if I, I'll take it back. This is before I worked for David Merrick. This was just, you know, a guy in New York who was stage managing and doing a whole bunch of other things. But I knew if I started dating this guy, I would start meeting all the people in his orbit. Right. And in that orbit, if I given if I could get into that orbit, then I knew that I could get jobs. And that's exactly what happened. I dated this guy. I met a lot of people through him. And that's how I got additional work. And this was a guy who I, I liked. He was uh, he was he was fun to spend time with. He was a very important producer off Broadway. He was Edward Albee's producer. He produced Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and a bunch of other things. But fortunately, he drank a lot, and very often he passed out at night, and I didn't have to do anything. But I deliberately walked into that situation because I knew that I would benefit from it. But I wasn't lured into it. I walked in full steam ahead. So yeah, there you have I don't it. know where I don't know where that puts me on the me too scale. <laughs> well, I think it's the reverse of casting couch. It's the person wanting the part that does what they have to do to connect. To get it. Yeah. Well, that was me. I would do what I had to do till I got that's, you know, and, and not all of that was bad, by the way. Not all of it was doing things like that. I just, you know, and I was just me. <laughs> so and I guess being me worked, whatever that means. It sure did. Now, as you know, in recent years, there's been a concerted effort to expand the diversity in casting to include more people of color, more ethnicity, more LGBTQ characters. Yes. Why do you think it took so long for this to happen? Good question. It took Will and Grace to make gay sidekicks, you know, or, or, or gay people allowable on allowable is the wrong word but it took will and grace to really cement that gay characters could be successful on television you know i remember in, in many casting sessions you know oh you no know, he comes across too gay or this whatever it just it was a very delicate situation in trying to deal with that and and will and grace just busted everything open you know every once in a while there would be a gay like there was uh, on uh, on uh, it was either Mary or Rhoda. The big reveal is that this guy uh, that Rhoda was dating was gay. There was always one, you know, one or two episodes of a show where there would be something gay, but uh, it wasn't until and, and I guess all the creators were the writers and directors were okay with this. That the networks were very very cautious about doing anything in that area. And I think, uh, what do you call it? What's the word? You mentioned it. And I was so happy that you mentioned it among, when you were introducing me, the AIDS movie, An Early Frost. Oh, I love that movie. Well, I loved it too. I I loved it too. And do you know what I did with that movie? Uh, Brandon Tartikoff wasn't sure about whether he was going to give it a go or not. And this is, this is, a, this is, a, this is so Joel Thurm, you know, Forget Brandon for a minute. I called his wife, Lily, who I had a relationship with. And I said, Lily, I'm going to send you a script. Call me after you read it. She called me. She said, Joel, this is this is wonderful. I said, OK, you're not going to sleep with your husband until he gives us a green light. Is that OK with you? And she laughed and she said, absolutely. <laughs> well, God bless you for doing that, because that movie to those of us from our generation who lived through that epidemic, that movie was incredibly powerful. And thank you for that. No, I mean, but by the way, I, I'm sure it, it would have been done without that. But that was the way I, I would, I would get to ensure things, you know, uh, to, to help things happen that I wanted to happen. Because I knew Lily. I knew the minute that Lily got on board, it would happen. 
<laughs> now we were talking and, about and by the way it was it, it without stars in the movie I mean, Ben Gazzara and Jenna Rollins were not big, huge names as performers, yes. But that was the highest rated movie of the year. Oh, it sure was. Now, we were talking about diversity in terms of gay characters. Oh, yeah. But you were one of the first casting directors to make a concerted effort to cast ethnically diverse actors on TV. Did you get a lot of pushback about that? None. None. It was something that it was just nobody really thought of it. Everybody, everybody assumed everything was white. But what I would do, and, and again, if I was dealing with a smart director or a smart producer, I'd say, well, look, why can't this part be black? Why can't this major supporting role be black or whatever? And more, more often than not, they would agree with me. But I, and especially in the little, when you're doing, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm now talking about my Starsky and Hutch days, where I, I had, the way that, that was set up, there were three different producers who were producing Starsky episodes, and it would go from one to the other to the other. But Aaron and Len gave me more power than the producers, and when it came to casting. And on those on those shows, and I and I think I did a, a pretty good job on it. But I one one on one episode there was a, a the, she was described the character was a middle aged uh, they didn't say Jewish but her name was Doctor Moskowitz, which sort of told me she was an older you know a middle aged Jewish woman. And she it was a, it was a uh, she played a doctor in a hospital or some whatever it was it was a purely expositional part she was just giving you information, and I hired a wonderful Chinese actress named Beulah Kuo, and because yes to make it more interesting you know it wasn't just you know you you always see Jewish doctors at that point we of course now you see Asian doctors all the time but at that point you you didn't. And it was a small part. And after she finished it, the part, she came to my office and she brought me a rose. Oh. Uh, to press. She said, no one's ever done that before. And she showed the little name tag that said, Dr. Helen Moskowitz. No one's ever done that for me before. Thank you. And to me, it, it's I didn't think I did something great, but that was so important to her to be considered for something that wasn't a Chinese part. Oh, I think it was monumental. What and I was, cried. <laughs> what was the impact on your job in the early 80s when cable TV networks like HBO and Showtime came on the scene? And that didn't affect me very much. It was just, you know, the, uh, the, the effect is just that broadcast networks had to loosen up a little bit and start doing some of the things that they did on cable. So in terms of casting, it didn't affect me at all. You wrote that in the last 20 years, most studios have become part of huge multinational corporations and the casting process has become more focused on covering your ass rather Absolutely. than doing good Absolutely. work. Absolutely. Absolutely. What, what did you mean by that? So I I stopped casting, I think, around, I don't know, like maybe uh, around 89, 90, when I left NBC. I left NBC tail end of 80. The last thing I worked on at NBC was uh, Seinfeld. And I have to tell you, my work consisted of Rick Ludwin, who was the NBC executive who was dealing with the show, said they want, and then he said they want Seinfeld, uh, the four characters. That's who they want. What do you think? I said, I think they're all great. <laughs> So that was my contribution to Seinfeld, nothing else. But, but no, but after it was okay. So after that, I stopped casting for about 10 years and try to produce my own product. And I did, you know, with some success and a lot of non success. But finally, I went back to casting and it was, and it was a horrible situation. It was a, and not a very funny script a half hour pilot, which by the way, is the hardest thing to cast is an unfunny half hour pilot. And especially if it's at the end of the season and it's for a company that's known to not pay very well. So that's the situation I was in. And at the, at the very first casting session, which I was usually, it's just, you know, I, 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 it was, yeah, I think it was the first session. There were two people from Paramount there were two people from there was the from Paramount executives, just executives. Then there was the line producer, it was a woman and her 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 assistant. 
Line producer had no business being there at all. So that's four. There were because it were representatives from UPN. There were like 11 or 12 executives in the room, all with their own uh, agenda. With their own agenda. Exactly. Thank you. And I found that horrible. I found you could uh, anything you're going to say in that room to the uh, and to an actor coming in, you're going to offend somebody. Wow. Again, example is when you do this line, could you just be a little more angry on it? Now, that was my own take. That may not have been the way the producers wanted that line read. But I might say that just to see if the actor could change something. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a horrific that's actually when I stopped casting, if you want me to tell you the rest of the story. Sure. Well, what happened was I figured, okay, well, the, the it was it was called The Bad Girl's Guide to the Universe or something. And the lead character was a, a young, uh, beautiful, young, funny woman. Well, you know, the, the people like that bo in both sexes do not grow on trees. <laughs> you know, they uh, they're very rare. But I figured, okay, it's just young. If she's that young, you just see all the people you possibly can because they're, they're new people coming up every every 30 seconds. There's a new one. And this woman came in and she was beautiful and she read, and I emphasize the script was not overly funny at all. And she read, and but she made sense of the script and I gave her a directing directorial change and she did it. And I said, okay, here's the full script. Can you come back on Thursday? And she came back, whatever, and she read again, and she read even better. And I'm thinking, okay, this is possible because her learning curve is up. So I bring her in for the four women producers and writer producers. And in the middle of her first reading, uh, a first paragraph, uh, I hear from the back, uh, one of the women says, thank you, which means, you know, goodbye. <laughs> right. And I let, I told the woman to go outside and wait a little bit. And while we talked about her and I said, well, I'm assuming you don't like her. I said, well, she didn't, she didn't, she, that paragraph that she read, that last paragraph is, you know, she didn't get it. It's very, it's, it's funny. And she got no laughs. And I bit my tongue to, I would say, who told you that paragraph is funny? Did your mothers tell you it was funny? Because it's not funny. But that was going on in my head. I didn't say that. But what I did do is after that woman left, I said, look, we have no one. So this woman is beautiful. Remember uh, Suzanne Summers on a very hit comedy? She was not a very good actress, but it worked. So I suggest we make a test deal. A test deal does not obligate us to hire her. It just puts a pin in her so we don't lose her. We don't have to do anything, but we won't lose her. And we have no one. And they wouldn't let me do that. The logic didn't make sense. So I said, well, you know what? You don't really need me because you know everything. So here's my casting book. Here's all my notes. You don't have to send me the second check. And good luck. And I walked away. <laughs> Wow, good for you. You know, you're really <laughs> love how principled you are. And of course, I have to mention that since retiring from show business, you've become a photographer and an artist. You've created a unique style called fantastical realism. <laughs> right? Yes, you how you've done your research, man. <laughs> yeah. When you take these original photos and you turn them into surreal, colorful images, they're just magnificent, Joel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, it's it's the this late life creativity that's that's come in. I don't know where it came from. The the book sort of was is the icing on the cake, you know. It's it's um but I've had I've had my I've had my show business career, then for a little while I've had my my photography career, which I still have, by the way. People are still buying those photos from a, a place in Palm Springs. So and and then now the right now this book. You know, yeah, it's, you're it's quite so, something. I want to I want to recommend to our viewers that you can check out Joel's website at joeltherm.com, where you can see his amazing photographs and buy them. You can also find out about his gallery showings. Well, Joel, I have only one more question for you, and it's this. Are you ready? Yeah. You wrote that in looking back at your life and career, you wish you had given more thought to Joel Thurm, the person, than to Joel Thurm, the casting director. Tell yes. me about the sacrifices you made for that career of yours. Well, I never thought of it as a sacrifice. 
you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm, uh, uh, I, I wasn't married. I didn't have, I don't have kids. I had, I had relationships, you know, of course, but my whole life was involved with my career, which is not at all unusual. You know, you couldn't separate the two of them. And it was only after that I stopped uh, casting that I realized there's a whole bunch of other things out in the world. There's travel, there's writing, there's this, there's that. But I was so caught up with my work, you know, um, that I just ignore and I ignore I ignored my family. I became much closer to my family after I stopped working, you know. So I don't know how to explain it better than that. Have I explained it? <laughs> I think you have the 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 attention and thought to Joel Therm the person happened after you retired when yes. you didn't have to be so ambitious and so driven and so. Uh, focused on the projects you were working on. Yeah. Well, you know, what happened after I retired, I mean, uh, among the things, I, I was, I was always good when it came to real estate. I had a good real estate sense and I bought an apart, I bought an apartment building in Oceanside, 12 unit apartment building. Well, guess who renovated 11 of those units with his own hands? <laughs> you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> If you looked at a picture of my house, my little shingle house, who do you think put every single shingle on the house? <laughs> I love, I love working with my hands and doing carpentry and painting and things like that. I, I, I did this at my uh, our house in Brooklyn when I was growing up. I was the one who, you know, scraped down the railings and repainted them. You know, to me, it's all it, it's it's because I was never a great athlete. I have. What's the word I say? If it if there's if there's anything to do with a hand, a ball, and an eye, forget that sport. I can't do it. I have no hand eye coordination with with that. My joke is if there are two balls involved, I'm okay. <laughs> but um, uh, so instead of you know spending all this time doing athletics, I was always in the arts and crafts shack. I was always doing things there. And believe it or not, shingling a house and putting in a floor is just arts and crafts on a little higher level. <laughs> so, quite, so I love that. You're quite an amazing guy. It's been such a pleasure meeting you and getting this chance to talk about your amazing career, your equally wonderful book. Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show, Joel. Well, thank you for having me. You know, I'm very flattered, you know, to, to be asked to do this. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure. Our guest has been the iconic casting director, author, photographer, and artist, Joel Thurm. His book, entitled Sex, Drugs, and Pilot Season, is available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my PR director, Laurie Towers, and my entire team at the XPTV1 Network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.